Let's talk about the Agile rollout at Salesforce. Salesforce started as a small team and they just normally did very quick releases, four weeks, and then they found as they grew, that became six weeks. And by 2007, they were having a lot of the dysfunctions that you get from a company or team that's implementing a waterfall process that, that isn't a good fit for them. So they would release and customers weren't finding the product content relevant. Nobody knew what to do about it. Everybody started blaming each other. Stuff like this happened. And their product cycles were so long that at any given time, they would have lots of employees that were in development that had never actually done a release. And the employees, the developers felt like they, they couldn't see their content working. There was a lot of, a lot of the confusion and hedging and, um, and, and consternation you get with big long cycle releases. So they decided to take a look at Agile. And after some examination, they decided to do it all at one time across the whole company. I think they call it the big plunge or big bang. And this is unusual. I think most practitioners would recommend a more organic rollout, but by most counts, they made it work and they made it work pretty well. They rolled it out across, I believe roughly 200 people in the development organization over a period of months. And by, I think they measured that 80% of their teams felt that they were self-organizing and it was going pretty well after they'd gotten their, their practice underway. And there are a few resources here where you can read about this in more detail if you're interested. And I will point out a few high points from the, both the lessons learned and the kind of things that they would do differently if they did it again. So let's talk about the outtakes, the things that they, they thought were really important. One is that they saw how important it was to have the executive commitment that they had. And the example they give is that they created a fixed date for their Agile release that they were going to do. And so when you fix a release date in Agile, the, the content is the thing that, that has to provide the slack. So if we don't get everything done, we're still going to release. It may not be everything. Well, there were certain parties that um, didn't want to do that. They wanted the content in, and some others felt that it was important to keep the date so that they were starting to get quicker releases. This is going to be a hard adjustment. And if the team overall, the executive team is behind it, it's probably going to be really hard for everybody to make a decision and avoid arguments and, and, and too much um, turmoil. So they found that was important. They created a cross-functional rollout team. Now, remember, it's important to keep in mind, this is for a massive all-at-one-time rollout. So this, you know, you, we talk about the importance of whole teams, interdisciplinary teams in Agile, and that, and that is important. Do you need a cross-functional Agile rollout team? Well, if you're going to do it at this scale, I would say it's very likely that you do. I mean, if you're going to get a whole bunch of testers, for instance, to do Agile all of a sudden, well, you probably need people who have really looked in a lot of detail, talked to their peers, read up, practiced, um, to be able to take that to other testers and explain what that's going to mean. Because if you're going to do it all at one time across such a big company, you probably need a pretty specific idea of what you're going to initially try that you can, that you can communicate and, and coach a lot of different people on it. They found that was important. They found it was important to focus on principles over mechanics. And I think what they mean by this is that they didn't oblige the teams to very specific agile practices. They left them a certain amount of discretion. You'll see later, they also um, found that they, they wish that they'd provided more rules around agile. And by that, I think that they mean, from what I can gather, that they wish they delineated more carefully what are the essential things, like, for instance, making sure that the software at an end of an iteration is potentially shippable. This is a thing that if you're doing Agile, you've got to do it. Whereas certain other practices, they wanted to leave open to the team's discretion about whether they practice them or not. A focus on automation. They mentioned that they already had a very extensive automation for building and testing, and they regarded that as an important thing. And the, the team that, that wrote this paper and was the, the executive leads on rolling out Agile mentioned that they feel like this created a major tailwind to help them along with the Agile process, that the degree of automation they'd achieved made this transformation a lot easier for reasons that, that you've learned about uh, in the importance of short cycles, continuous integration. They provided radical transparency. The rollout team, the senior rollout team, would have open meetings. Anybody could come and hear about what they were grappling with and what they were working on. And... Um, they, they use professional training. So to, to do it this quick at this scale, they used outside training and outside coaches 
though they, they mentioned that they did bring in their own two-hour module that they, that they gave to the individual team members that didn't go to outside training. Now we're on to lessons learned. So these are things, if you read the, the paper that the executive leads wrote, these are things that they wish they'd done differently or things they wish they'd emphasized a little bit more as they went through the process of rolling out Agile. They wish that they'd involved more contributors early so that they, they brought more people in and asked them how things are going. One example of this that they give is the use of unconferences. Now, you may or may not know what these are. This is a format of meeting or conference where the attendees come in and they present things that they think would be good to work on and talk about in the meeting, the workshop, and then the entire audience has a chance to vote on those. And if you're, you have a threshold, kind of like your backlog, you know, of things that you're going to present, say five, and there's 10 things, well, the top um, five things with the most votes are the things you end up working on. So this is a very self-organizing way to figure out what's important and, and what you should be working. And they, they wish that they'd done more of this early with the individual contributors, things like this. They found that they wanted more training for the product owners. They wish that they'd gotten more of the I think product managers and program managers, primarily the people that they put into these roles, they wish that they'd gotten them to more training early. They found that for a product manager who's used to working in a waterfall environment, the immediacy and the amount of guidance and day-to-day and, uh, -day work with the development teams that they needed to do was really different than the way that they were doing things at their old jobs and that the, they wish they'd done more training to prepare them for that. They found outside coaching valuable, and they wish they'd prioritize this test infrastructure even more, which I think is, is notable just to kind of flog this even more, the importance of automated testing, because this was already a really big asset for them and a thing that they, they had to a certain degree. They found that it was useful to, and they wish they'd done more of giving the executives actual deliverables. And what, what they mean is not providing deliverables over to the executives, but instead, asking the executives to help them in certain specific ways to really bring them into the process in a hands-on way where they're involved. And I mentioned this earlier, they wish they were more clear about the Agile rules. So this is kind of the envelope of standardization that they put around the Agile process. So they, from what I understand, this is their view of the things that they said, look, these things are intrinsic to Agile, you have to do them. These things are agile techniques and practices that you can decide whether they're making sense or not for your individual team. So they wish they were more clear about those. So those are some notes on the rollout at Salesforce. Different situation than, than Spotify, uh, less organic in the sense of happening over time with growth and, and kind of interesting though for a company that wants to do agile quickly over a large group of people. That Big Bang recipe may or may not be the right thing if you're in a big organization, but um, if you are and you're interested, I would certainly read the supplemental materials that are available here about how things went for the, the folks at Salesforce. And it, it remains a really interesting example of, of agile practice at a large firm.